Um, is this, oh, this is working. Good evening. And I want to thank Ali for that nice introduction. And I want to tell you how happy I am to be here, especially so that I can talk to you future entrepreneurs that are uh, seated in the back rows there. So why are we here? <laughs> we, we should ask ourselves, why have we all come here? And I think it's because we're all interested in business. Some of you might be interested in coffee. You know. um, the, um, the thing about business is that it uh, works better. Woo. It, nope. It works better if you do it right from the start, like it says on the screen there. Life is much easier when you do things correctly. And this evening, uh, we'll have a, plenty of examples from the first 10 years of Starbucks, which is the period that I know very well. I was there, I was a co-founder, and I was the vice president there for 10 years. Um, and we'll have uh, lots of examples that only one of the founders would know. These are not the stories that are in the books that you may have read about Starbucks, and it's uh, stories that aren't on the company's website. They're personal stories. And the reason I'm going to use, tell you these stories is that they illustrate 10 points about small business that I would like to make tonight. The, um, we're going to have a theme. There's a hint about the theme on the screen. Uh, and I think that our theme is going to show you the, um, the life of an entrepreneur, a small business owner, uh, as it really is. Uh, there's a little bit of romance about it, but the reality is that there's sometimes uh, things to overcome. Uh, so let's play you a short video uh, this video does not have sound. So, that little video was a race a track and field event called the 110 meter hurdles. It's an Olympic event. And uh, by the way, those men did that in about 13 seconds. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, and the hurdles to me are exactly what it's like to start a business or to improve a business. There is something that gets in your way every few seconds. And the, um, the athletes in this video that we just saw, uh, certainly they have natural ability. I mean, these are the high, some of the fastest people on the, on the planet. Uh, but they also do some things that business people do. And it's surprising sometimes. Uh, they make a plan. Uh, they have coaches. Uh, they use strategy. Maybe they go to seminars. Um, just like business owners do. And um, I have another silent video for you. And th this one might surprise you a little bit. Uh, why don't we look at it first? Oop, what have I done? I hit something that I don't know what I've done. Thank you. How are you? Good, <laughs> it's good to see you. I hit the... Mm -hmm. Thank you. So to make a play, I just push the arrow now. Right? Uh, Thank you. Okay. Well, we could see this again. So we're gonna, shortly, we're going to see another video. It's another hurdles race, but it's quite different. He is not dead. 
um, and the reason I, show, I wanted to show you that video um, is that um, there are many things that can make you fall. It's not always that you get over the hurdles. Sometimes you trip on it and um, you fall, and that's very much like business. And um, those falls, they're painful. Uh, they're painful for you, they're painful for your banker, they're painful for your family. Uh, and I'm hoping that my talk tonight will keep you from falling at least once. <laughs> now, before we start, I want to uh, say something that is probably very obvious to you. I'm from the United States, and I uh, don't quite understand many things about doing business in the Gulf. So if I say something that sounds a little weird to you, that that would never work here, I hope that you will translate it into something that will work here so that uh, the, the real message gets across. I hope that doesn't happen too often. So, oh, let's see here. We're going to have an, uh, 10 hurdles, as I said, and I want to look at them with you. Uh, they are in three groups. The right type of business, competition, government regulation, The right amount of money, that's an interesting one, uh, forecasting, alternative or different ways to f fund a company, the right sources of funding, that's who you get your money from, the right ratios, and then finally, the team of people, which includes some people that are going to be a surprise to you, and marketing everybody's favorite subjects. So, uh, we've started the race, and uh, now we're going to um, deal with this first group, and there's our first hurdle. We have to get over it, and it's the right type of business. The, um, how would you choose the right type of business? And um, I'm going to go back 40 years now. This is a Starbucks story. So, when you look at Starbucks today, it would be an understatement to say, yeah, it looks like a pretty good idea. Um, this is a worldwide company now. And at the time, of course, it didn't exist in 1971. And actually, I should tell you that after just 10 years, in 1980, Starbucks was already a successful company, but it was a successful company in a place the size of Kuwait City, uh, Seattle, Washington. And now, of course, um, it's 2013, and it's an international phenomena, especially here in Kuwait. In the, in, in the Gulf region, uh, you know, coffee has been enjoyed uh, oh, since the seventh century, a long time, and uh, you know, Starbucks didn't get into uh, being until the late part of the 20th century. So I, when I think about this, I think, it took us only 13 centuries to catch up with you. That's a long time. So how did the founders of Starbucks actually think of the idea? And I first want to say that we thought of the idea of Starbucks <coughs> the way the people back there are going to think of their business idea. The, um, the idea that we happened on, of course, is selling fresh roasted, very high quality coffee with a great deal of, of uh, customer service. And uh, before I begin to explain how we did this, I'm going to show you a picture that may, may stun you. That is me in the middle. This picture was, was taken in oh, about 1968, and those are my two partners. And at the time, this is two years before Starbucks w uh, was born. We had no idea about Starbucks. But I show you this picture because I want you to understand that the founders of Starbucks 
were just three guys, you know, three people that um, had a good idea. So this is the, our subject here is the right type of business. Uh, so here's what happened. My two partners and I, Gordon Bowker and Jerry Baldwin, uh, had been trying to think of ideas for a business. And uh, one day we were having one of our regular meetings, and for some reason on this day we went to a French restaurant. And the, the, I, we wanted to be uh, entrepreneurs, you know, like some of you. And I was a teacher at that time. Uh, Gordon Bowker was a journalist. He was a writer for a magazine. And Jerry Baldwin was one of, you know, 50,000 people working for the Boeing company, the manufacturer of airplanes in Seattle. And all three of us wanted to have a little more excitement in our lives. And um, I'm sure you understand that. <laughs> we wanted to also have a little more independence. So at that lunch in uh, 1970, for some reason, it ended with a cup of coffee that was served to us, and that coffee was terrible. It was a bad cup of coffee. You may have had this experience in which you have a bad cup of coffee at the end of a meal, and it ruins the whole meal because it leaves a bad taste in your mouth. So we were talking about that, you know, how could this restaurant do this to us? It's a wonderful French restaurant. And uh, one of my partners said to me, you know, I just ordered a one-pound bag of coffee from a coffee company uh, in Northern California. And I looked at him and I said, well, that's really strange because I just ordered a pound of coffee from a gourmet coffee company in Vancouver, British Columbia, in Canada. And we, we, the two of us looked at each other and said, boy, that's some coincidence. Um, and what we did is we put the idea of a coffee company on our list of good ideas for a business. And that really was the seed from which Starbucks grew. It was that simple. Just three young men talking about business ideas. Um, now, at the time, there were no gourmet coffee companies in Seattle, and there were no coffee bars. Uh, this was before the modern coffee revolution. Uh, in Seattle now, I don't, if you went there, you would see people walking around with cups of coffee. It's really amazing. Um, so I began the research on the subject of coffee. And I'm, I'm a good business researcher, I still am. And uh, at, by the way, at the time, it was more difficult to do research because guess what we did not have in 1971? The internet. Um, so I traveled, in my, part of my research is I got in my car and I drove down the west coast of the United States and I stopped at businesses that had anything to do with coffee. There weren't very many. Um, and then later I was in New York City and I visited a couple of companies there. And I have to tell you that only one of the many companies I visited had anything going for it at all. Only one of them impressed me. And when the research was done, the three of us met, just like, this sounds, I don't know, a little bit like a project in a, a, a business class at the university, but it, it really happened this way. Uh, we met and we discussed the idea, and we looked at the research, and we had done a, a forecast, a financial forecast, and we decided, okay, we're going to do this. And um, once we made that decision, uh, it began a startup period that lasted six months, and I can assure you that we did not sleep much during that six months. It was very, very hard work. Uh, now, you want to choose the right type of business, uh, a good idea. Uh, and of course, it has to be an idea that's right for the customers that you think you're going to be selling to. Uh, you unfortunately have to think beyond yourself, beyond your friends, beyond your family, you have to think about the public. And um, so today, not, you know, in the year 2013, what would be a really bad idea for a business? Well, I have one, uh, based on being here in Kuwait City uh, for a few days. Um, 
I think a pretty bad idea would be a business that was a service that repaired typewriters. When was the last time any of you used the typewriter? Um, so, you know, you don't want to pick an idea that would be a bad idea. And that, that's an extreme example. So, how many categories are there to choose among? Well, what kind of a business could you possibly open? And let's take a look at a partial list. This list has a number of good uses. So, here we have uh, manufacturing, uh, distribution. I saw lots of distribution companies as I was driving around Kuwait today. Um, construction, oh, there's plenty of construction here. Uh, software and then apps, the apps are for telephones, of course. And then retail, retail is really interesting in the 21st century. There's um, actual retail, like you might see at a mall. And then there's virtual retail, which you can't see, it's only on your computer, but it's still retail, you can buy products. I am sure, well, I would guess that some of the clothing that's in this room today might have been bought on the web. Um, there's food service, food service includes coffee bars, agriculture, media, service businesses. Now there's another really interesting category. Service businesses includes a computer consultant, uh, but it also includes a company that has people that go out and, and take care of swimming pools, maintain swimming pools. All of those are service businesses. And you might ask, um, hey, why, why, did, why did Zev Siegel put this list on the screen? And the answer is that these businesses have different characteristics, these types of businesses. So for example, um, which of, of, of the companies, of the types of businesses on the screen, do you think would cost a lot of money to get started? Well, I would say that one of them would be manufacturing. Oh my gosh, you need a place to, uh, you need a, uh, a warehouse and a machinery and skilled people to operate the equipment and raw materials and a, uh, an inventory of finished goods. It's, it's pricey. And which do you think would be the least expensive to start? Now, I know some of you know this. It's the service business. If you're a consultant, for instance, if you're, especially if you are a social media consultant, what do you need to have a business? A, co a portable computer, a telephone, maybe a business card, maybe not, uh, a place on LinkedIn, maybe a website. You could have the whole business for uh, 5,000 US dollars. That's the whole business, and you can make a good living. So these, are very d these, these uh, categories of businesses have very different characteristics, and I would advise the people in the back of the room to be very careful about the category, because if you pick the wrong one, you might not be able to get the business open. So, let me get it organized here. Where does Starbucks fit on this list? Well, let me go back. Where did Starbucks fit on this list when we opened our doors in 1971 with one store? And the answer is retail, because when we opened our doors, we were not yet manufacturing. We weren't roasting coffee. For the first six months, uh, a close friend of ours roasted our coffee for us. The, um, and you'll hear more about that. Um, so we were an actual retail company, not a virtual company. In 1971, there was no virtual retail company. Um, and then we expanded and became a manufacturer. So we went into another category, and we immediately found out that that's an expensive category, <laughs> believe me. And then we became a distributor because we started selling coffee to restaurants, hundreds of them. Uh, I think at one point we were selling to three or 400 restaurants. Um, and then we'd been, when we added, um, we started charging for coffee beverages about 1980. And, um, well, if we're charging for coffee, and, well, then we're in the food service business. So we've now gone into another business. And then early in the 21st century, sometime after the year 2000, uh, Starbucks added a website 
capable of e-commerce, selling coffee and other things. So now they're in a fifth business, and each business has different characteristics. So the question is, for you, for you to think about, where will your business fit on this list? And what will your business cost? And will you expand into other areas? It's a good question. So I want to move on uh, to talk about what I think are two very unusual reasons why the gourmet coffee business was such a good business in 1971 and why it is still a good business. Where I live, coffee roasting companies with coffee bars are still opening. I'd say every year there's another one in Seattle and none of them ever close. <laughs> they're all, they just stay and there are more of them. It's quite an interesting thing to watch. So here is reason number one why the gourmet coffee business is so great. Okay, all you science students, what is that? It's the formula for caffeine. That is the scientific formula for caffeine. Caffeine is a really good reason why the coffee business is so productive, because people love their caffeine. It keeps them awake, uh, especially when you're studying for exams. Um, and uh, it's legal. That's nice. <laughs> uh, and I think, when I look back now, I think caffeine is, was more important than I realized. The, um, another reason why it, it was a good idea is profit margins. And I'm going to explain this. Notice I, that was the plural. I said profit margins. There's more than one. So we built a coffee roasting plant, a reasonable one. And we started roasting coffee, of course, after the first six months. And that's a manufacturing facility. You know, we talked about that. And we owned retail stores. Pretty simple, right? So we roasted the coffee. We made a little, we made a little money doing that. Then we, on paper at least, in our records, we sold the coffee we had roasted to our own stores. Now, we owned the stores, but on paper we would sell it to them. Uh oh, there's a profit there. Then, then the stores sold it to people like you and me, our customers. And of course, you make a profit there. Typically in retail, it's um, uh, half of the sales price. And so the, you see what's happening? There's manufacturing profit. We wholesaled it to our own stores. Our stores sold at retail. OK, then we made another step. Once we started having coffee bars in our stores, we took some of the coffee we had transferred to the store, put it in the coffee bar part, ground it up, and made beverages out of it. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this, but you get about 40 to 50 cups of coffee from a pound of coffee. We sell in the United States, we sell it by the pound, not the kilo. Um, and, you know, the coffee beans uh, aren't as expensive as you think, and you use, but the drinks are. Are, is it expensive to go to Starbucks? Yeah, yeah. Um, so you, you see these profits are piling up. And th I think that that is a, the second reason, after caffeine, why Starbucks um, was a good idea and also why other coffee businesses are a good idea. Let's move on to a new subject. Oh, look where we are. So, you're going to start a business. I mean, there, how should I put this? There are people sitting down here who are hoping you're going to start a business. And um, I would say, you know, what, um, you should ask yourself some questions. I think these questions might be in your packet. Um, are you interested in it? Would you get into a business that you aren't interested in? That would be like having a regular job. Um, do you have the capabilities? This is something that your, uh, your bank wants to know and other people want to know. Are you really capable of doing this? Or is it just something that's way beyond you? Is there demand for it? 
Remember I said you had to think beyond your friends and your family. Is this, does anybody really want this? Um, can you connect with customers at a reasonable cost? So for the marketing students that are here, uh, you know, I would say uh, th this is about marketing. If you have a company that requires really expensive marketing, you, know, you have to buy television and all kinds of things, um, that's not a reasonable cost, that's a high cost. Um, have your competitors left room for you? I think that this is sometimes a problem with restaurants. Now, Kuwait is a town with lots of great restaurants. I've been to three or four of them already, and uh, oh, I just love them. But if I was going to open another restaurant here, I think I'd want to be careful to make sure that my restaurant wasn't like everybody else's. Um, can you assemble enough capital, money? Well, suppose you have, you're going to be a manufacturer, which you remember I said takes a lot of money, uh, and it turns out that your family can only put in some of the money, and uh, your bank's not that interested in you right now. Where are you going to get the money? So can you assemble enough money? And finally, <laughs> the biggest question of all, is it going to be profitable? You can open it without being profitable, well, profitable but what's going to happen after a few months? Uh-oh, you're going to run out of money. Um, so if you, let, let's look at this list now while it's on the screen. Remember the example of the typewriters? We're going to open a service that re repairs typewriters. Let's go through that one with the first three questions. Are you interested in it? Well, it turns out that you just love typewriters. Your grandfather gave you one when you were 10 years old, and you took it apart and put it together, and you've learned about all kinds of typewriters. Yes, you are interested. Great. Do you have the capabilities? Well, you've actually studied typewriters, and uh, you know uh, uh, where to buy all the parts for them. That's great. Is there a demand? None. There's no demand at all. So it's not a good idea, it's not the right idea, it's a really bad idea. So what do you do? And I know that that's a silly example, please forgive me for being silly. Um, what do you do when you have a, um, a bad idea? Well, if you're an entrepreneur, what do you do? You try to make it a good idea. You know, you change it, you think, oh, this is really a good idea, I can, I can make it work. It's the idea that I thought of. It's really good. Um, and then what if, it, after you've played with the idea for a while, what if you can't really make it into a good idea? Well, I have some advice for you. If you can't make it into a good idea, it's a bad idea, just forget about it. Because it will be a waste of time, and if you start the business, it'll be a waste of money. Forget about it. There will be another idea, believe me. Um, so we've made a good start here on our uh, 10 hurdles. This was the first hurdle. And uh, let's see what we learned here. Understand a good idea compared to a bad idea. It's very helpful if you know the basic types of business, like manufacturing or service. And be realistic about what is a good idea for you, not for somebody else. What's going to work for you? Oh, this, <laughs> this is just like business, right? You get over one hurdle, and then there's another one. So we have another hurdle. Um, the, um, this hurdle is competition. And this turns out to be pretty interesting in the coffee business. Um, so. How about um, if you had a business, would you like some, competi some competitors? Well, most people would say no. But um, I, I think that um, competitors have some positive attributes. And uh, first we should probably talk about what is a competitor? Now that's a huge subject. Uh, you know, we could talk about what is a competitor uh, and, you know, until the end of the week on Thursday, if you'd like to. 